Father, thanks so much for bringing us to this place, to this gathering, the time together after your own heart, for you love life, you created us, you saved us, and we pray that you guide each of us and equip us to be the shining light in this world that it needs so desperately. We trust you for that, we know it's not by our might or our power, but by your spirit, and so we take heart and trust in you, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm Pastor Mike Newman. I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and now I'm in my biographical info. I've been a mission, a missionary. I helped plant churches for the past ten years in Texas. Yay! Yeah, go Texas! And just this summer, I was elected district president. So I'm officially district president. Oh, we like got a cheering section out there. It's good because I get to continue the mission help equip more people to reach others with Jesus. So it's great. Having a good time there. My wife Cindy and I have been married for 35 years. We have, <laughs> I agree. It's always good to cheer. And uh, we have two daughters, two adult daughters and their families. Both are married. We moved from Chicago to Texas. Both said they'd never marry Texas boys or live in the country. And Jesus laughed. You know? <laughs> so they both married Texas boys. They live in the country. My younger daughter you know, she's such a fashion person, but now they raise cattle. Oh. So she does, oh, the amazing things with cattle she does. And uh, they're having a great time, though. And then my older daughter and her husband have our granddaughter, Harley. She's seven years old. And they started their own tree business. So that he's an arborist. She's a financial analyst, but she does all the books and taxes and all that kind of stuff. And helps in the field a little bit, too, there. Adventurous entrepreneurial millennials. So it's great. God is good. So thank you for them. And uh, today we're going to talk about hope when your heart breaks. Uh, this is the. It's a title of uh, a book, my latest book from Concordia Publishing House. I'll talk about it a little bit. But you know, when it comes to life issues, it's so important to understand that typically this is not an intellectual policy issue. When, it, when we talk about life issues, we're talking about matters of the heart. We're talking about people's stories, difficult times, heartbreak, ways they've been shocked or hurt or surprised, whether it's the diagnosis of a terminal illness, the loss of a loved one, an unexpected pregnancy, disruption of family. One thing after another all adds up to a story that really brings pain. And oftentimes in these stories, there are people around who unfortunately exacerbate that pain or make it even more difficult, whether it's through an unkind word, some cliche messages given to a person, it's difficult. So my hope for our time together is that you'll be equipped to be able to not only understand your story and perhaps some heartbreaks that you have experienced or will experience, but you'll be able to walk with others in heartbreak and have some insight and resources to do that well and truly shine the light of Jesus' love. We're going to talk about five gifts God gives in the midst of heartbreak. There's a lot more gifts that he gives. We may get to five. We'll see if we do. And what we're going to see is that it's first God who lives this out with us. And along the way, he teaches us his paths. And then Christ, as he dwells in us, allows us to imitate and share the gifts God gives in the heart. So before we talk about any steps or intellectual approaches, you know that that's not, those of you, you know, we all have a story. And if you've been in the valley of heartbreak and loss, grief or shock or pain, you know that during those times you don't need someone to come along and say, let me give you three easy steps to, so you can just get past this thing. It's not what it's about. It's about truly being in the valley and going through the deep emotions you feel when you're encountering this kind of difficulty. So let's just try to get to that place. Okay, That's what I want to do first. I just want to get to that place. I don't know if you recognize this place, but this is Sutherland Springs. It's not far from where I live. It's where a gunman came in 
with an AR-15 and began shooting parishioners, young and old. Uh, one of the pastors of my home church in San Antonio lives nearby. His wife is actually a school counselor for the elementary school in this area. And uh, this happened on a Sunday. And on Monday, the bodies of the victims were still lying in the church. And law enforcement and agencies were doing what they needed to do. And uh, my pastor's wife was at the school. And they had to give instructions to the teachers and say, if there's an absence, don't ask why. Because they didn't know if one of the little kids were one of the victims. They didn't know the victims at the time. And so uh, it was a very, very difficult time. Uh, my pastor went to that school because they invited him to come to do a devotion with the teachers. And when he got into the school, it was a public school, got into the school, the teachers asked if he would, after he said a few words, if he would pray with them. And all the teachers gathered around together, embracing each other in the public school, asking for Jesus' help. Because their kids and their families uh, were in there. There were no trite statements that apply during a time like that. And even the uh, first responders were devastated by what they saw and by the impact. Um, so this is a place where heartbreak dwells. You know, if you feel those feelings, and even I get emotional talking about it, that's what people are going through. And you've been there too. You know what it's like. This is... Uh, the devastation that just took place from Hurricane Michael. And it's uh, one person who came back to see their home. And that loss, obviously you see in the picture, is beyond words. What do you do? Where do you go? What do you say? When someone experiences the loss of everything. And we know lives were taken as well by that storm. Some so unexpectedly, a tree falls on a house and a little child dies. You know, how can you quantify that, or how can you even approach such a heartbreaking situation. The Bible describes this time of life when we, when the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep for words in Romans chapter 8. Those groans. Some of you have been in, in the valley of that groaning, and I've been there too. This is a picture from the remnants of the limo that crashed in New York, where <clears throat> people died. Celebrating birthdays, wanting to have a vehicle that would be safe if they were having a party. And one of the worst automobile accidents that have taken place in our history. All, all those young families, lives cut short, children left without parents. So this is the kind of valley, this is where people hurt, become despondent, become depressed, get angry, get angry at one another, get angry at God. And these situations are the, are the places where the shouts and the cries and the vehement arguments come from when you talk about life issues. They come from hearts like this. It's important for us to know that and remember that. And not to get uh, knocked off track and make this just a government policy talking head issue on the news. This is really a place where hearts need to be remembered and where you as God's people need to set the pace and set the tone for the conversation in our culture. But right now, there's so many trying to set the tone for conversation. And they do it to get votes or, or to get advertisers. We have to remember that this is a sacred issue, and that these people are dearly loved by God, and that this is the way we approach the issue, is hearts relating to other hearts. Uh, this is where my daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter live in Fredericksburg, Texas. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's quite a tourist town. Beautiful place in the hill country of Texas. Just in about an hour north of San Antonio. Uh, these balloons were all over the sea one day. My wife happened to be actually driving our granddaughter home that day. What happened, a little boy named Noah, he was two years old, went to bed one night healthy and strong, and his mom and dad read him a story, and. Mom was pregnant with their second child, and they were all excited about their second baby, a baby girl. But when they woke up the next morning, Noah had died. They don't know why, 
It was unexpected and, as you maybe can imagine, absolutely shocking, devastating. And so they soldiered on and prepared for Noah's funeral. And Noah's mom put out on Facebook, my son loved colored balloons. And all around the country she said, if you could just put out some colored balloons on the day of the funeral, and we just want to pay tribute to him. So on the day of the funeral, the town of Fredericksburg was absolutely covered with colored balloons outside the houses, on the ranch fences. See, if you don't know Texas, Texas has a lot of ranches and gates and people own lots of land. Well, all the way out into the country, my, my daughter and son all live about a half hour outside of town in the country. All in the country and through the town were these clusters of colored balloons. I think it happened all around the nation. And a family just needed a little bit of support, a little indication that they weren't alone during this awful loss of their little girl. Just terrible. See, these are the stories. Those are the hearts. That's what we have to remember. And that's why there's no other way to approach life issues and heartbreak than with compassion. The compassion of Jesus. Even in the face of someone's total anger or militance or defiance, we always need to remember as God's people, there is a story. There's a story here. And the only way to get to know the story is to be with that person. And so that's what I want to talk about. The first uh, gift, you don't, you don't have to share your stories, but you have them, don't you? You know. This is when you have to go back to those places, and it's hard to do. It's hard to do. But you have to go back to those places to recover your humanity, your need, and your heart when you step into this arena of talking to someone who is going through a shocking change in their lives or difficulty or loss or heartbreak. To the angry parents or to the mother who aborted her child or to the family that is absolutely torn up because their loved one is comatose or living, uh, wasting away in a bed somewhere, in a nursing home or in a care center, and so angry and wanting to do anything to spare that person pain and seeing no purpose in it. This is where you have to go. Not to get into a debate first, but to remember the heart and the pain and to validate that pain. To have a deep understanding and go there again with that person. So first I want to ask you, before I talk about that first gift, is what is not helpful to hear in situations like this? What's not helpful to hear? I completely understand. Yeah, I completely understand. Yeah, not helpful to hear. Now you may, you may relate, but first of all, on the front end of this, that's not, your job is not to turn it back around to you. How many times have I been in hospital rooms? I remember this young woman dying of colon cancer, two little girls, and being with her in the hospital room and having people walk into the room and instead of just being with her and listening to her, starting to talk about their own story, their own hassle and traffic and parking and all this stuff, get it? Oh man, it's not what you need. Not, not then. What else? God needed your loved one in heaven. Oh, God needed your loved one in heaven. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Definitely. Yes. God never gives you more than you can bear. Right. God oh. never gives you more than you can bear. Yeah, it's not in the Bible, you know? It's not in the Bible. Yeah, who said that? Yeah, not God. Not God. Yes. This is part of God's plan. This is part of God's plan, right. Oh, man. It's no time to talk about the mysteries of the sovereignty of God. Or, no, 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 no. God never planned that we should die. He never planned that. It breaks His heart, and, and we see that as His own Son gave His life on the cross. The Father's heart was broken. Yes. All things work together for good. All things work together for good. Yeah, it's a great verse, but no, no, no. Not, not now. Not, not in those situations. Right? He's not in a better place. He's in a better place, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Time heals all wounds. Time heals all wounds. You're fast forwarding through a person's 
Grief, yeah, let's get done with it. And we live in this microwave society where it's very difficult for us to walk slowly through people's difficulties, sometimes a lifetime of difficulty, and allow them to live in that pain and experience that pain. So there's so much not to say. And really, the best thing to do and advice is, you know, don't just say something, stand there. Be there. And that's the first gift God gives. It's the gift of presence. The gift of presence. And I'm going to just touch on Jeremiah a little bit as we talk today. Uh, I'm read to you from Jeremiah chapter, chapter 1. If you have a Bible or on your phone or something, you can look at this too. So, let me just start out. It's the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. And you think, why is he starting like this? Uh, but what Jeremiah experiences here is a total uprooting, total heartbreak, the unexpected in his life. So the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of jo Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. Aren't you glad I didn't ask you to read that? It's one of those verses. But let's take it apart a little bit. Jeremiah is the son, he, so he's a prophet, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests. What was Jeremiah supposed to be when he grew up? A priest. He thought he'd be a priest. And, but God had a different plan for him. And God called him to be a prophet. He's known as the weeping prophet. He was called to a, a life of difficulty, of pain, of loss, of death threats, of seeing his loved ones stray from God. It was, a, it was a terrible life. In fact, it mentions Zedekiah, son of Josiah. Uh, Josiah was a friend, but Zedekiah actually became an enemy. And when Jeremiah came in with a prophetic message, Zedekiah stood there, and as Jeremiah gave him the message in writing, Zedekiah cut it up and threw it into the fire. Can you imagine that? If you're taking your Bible and saying, but it says God so loved the world, and someone takes the page, rips it up, and throws it into the fire. You know, it was an expression of the kind of opposition Jeremiah expressed. And this is what it says here, verse 4, Before the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born... I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah didn't say, Okay, Lord, here I am. Like Isaiah did. He said, Ah, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. And the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out His hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build and to plant. What Jeremiah experienced was a sharp turn in his life. It was totally unexpected. It took his breath away. It broke his heart and sent him into territory he didn't know how to navigate. And what did God say to him? God say, well, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to give you ten easy things you can do. I'm going to give you, uh, just get over it, Jeremiah. You know, move on. What God said to him is, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I'm with you. There's a book by Eugene Peterson called Run With Horses, and he writes uh, about Jeremiah. It's based on Jeremiah 12, verse 5, where um, God says, if you cannot keep up with men, how will you run with horses? It's the one sermon from seminary I'll never forget. William Schmelder preached it. And it just really was inspiring. And I've written about it a little bit in some of my other books. But let me read you a quote from, I'll show it to you, from Eugene Peterson. This talks about life and how we're called to live. It says the, the only place you have to be human is where you are right now. And then this gets very Lutheran. The only opportunity you will ever have to live by faith is in the circumstances you are provided this very day. This is where we live by faith. In our day-to-day -day life, in our heartbreak, in our hurts, in our valleys, this is where we live by faith. And this is the theology of the cross. Really. So we live by faith in the midst of difficulty. Let me just read you a little quote from 
Uh, my book, Hope When Your Heart Breaks, I'll talk about it. There's some copies CPH has them around too. It says, uh, you may feel like you're in a prison as you grieve. You've been unwillingly confined and unjustly held captive. You're in a cell, a dark cell with claustrophobic walls pressing in on you. You didn't ask for this darkness. You never wanted this pain. And you'd prefer not to have to endure the journey. But here you are. At each step of the way, and in this little section I talk about Joseph imprisoned and away from his homeland. It says, Joseph was not alone. The prevailing theme of Joseph's story in Genesis chapters 37 through 50 is not one of crushing loss, and the same for Jeremiah, but one of God's persistent pursuit of Joseph in his pain. That's the theme of your story too. God pursues you in the prison of your grief. He, ten he is tenaciously reaching out to you at this very moment. At every turn, in darkness and in light, while you're occupied with other things or wrestling with your grief, as you lie awake at night, God pursues you with His steadfast love and His strengthening faithfulness. But that's the first gift, presence. God's presence. It's, it's miraculous. It's through His Word. It's through baptism and the Lord's Supper. It is mystical. It is weighty. You know, the glory of God means the weight of God. God's first gift in heartbreak is presence. Let me just read you a little bit about uh, Jeremiah from my book. But Jeremiah didn't only receive an unfulfilling task, he was also given a reassuring promise. God promised to be with Jeremiah. That powerful promise takes place throughout God's Word. For every challenge, in every unwanted assignment, through self-doubt and uncertainty, God promises you His presence. One of Jesus' final statements before He ascended into heaven, and you know what it is from Matthew 28, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. The greatest meaning in your life may not be in what you do, or what you say, or what you accomplish, or how you think up solutions but in how Jesus meets you where you are. Jeremiah knew God needed him to serve in a thankless and heartbreaking role, but he was confident that God would never abandon him on the arduous journey. You may feel like your place in life is a waste of your gifts, but that precise place may be where God needs what you can uniquely give. Your unwanted journey may be God's most urgent mission. That's why you need God's presence every step of the way. For Even for unwanted journeys, perhaps especially for them, God gives His living Word to nourish you and His presence in Holy Communion to renew you. He is with you to encourage you, strengthen you, and help you. God's presence. Words cannot quantify or describe this precious gift that you are not alone. And this gift transforms you. First, you receive it. You have to know for your heartbreak. And I would imagine that all of you know what this is. And all of you probably have it somewhere in the background of your life. God is walking with you. He is present. And the meaning of the theme verse for this conference is that He carries you. He pursues you and carries you. Psalm 139, it says, even when I go try to get far away and in the darkest place, even you're there, Lord. Even the dark is light to you. It's all Him. It's all His grace. And that's such an important gift you've been given. You can lay awake at night in hopelessness, sadness, crying tears, and crying out that God is there with you, holding on to you. You don't have to buck up you don't have to get your act together. You don't have to figure it out. God is with you. There's a great song by Stephen Curtis Chapman. It's an album that I love called The Glorious Unfold. And he lost his daughter to a tragic accident. His own son accidentally hit his daughter and killed her. But he says, lay your head down tonight. Take a rest from the fight. Don't try to figure it out. We're not here to figure it out. And that's the same. See, God gives you this gift for others who are broken and grieving. 
Your job isn't to come in and speak the magic words. It's not to give them all of God's great wisdom from the Scriptures or have that little statement that will suddenly fix them and make it all right. God calls you to be like Him, to be present, to quietly be there, to show up, to persist in that presence and not try to figure it out, not try to make any sense of it. And when you hear the cries or the screams, when you see the tears and the heartbreak, it's to hold a hand and to be there. It's to validate that and understand that this will be a long journey, a journey of a lifetime. And only one day will make it all come together. God may give little glimpses along the way by His grace later on. But only on the day when Jesus returns will the tears be wiped away. And your calling as a Christian, see, our culture needs Christians who understand this, who understand the heart of God, and who reflect Him. This is what our culture needs. This is the strength, I think, of our church, too, because it is sola scriptura, sola gratia. It's the Word of God, His presence, the presence of Christ, His grace. To understand that you bear this presence of Christ. There's a spiritual battle that takes place in heartbreak and grief and life issues. And you bear the presence of Jesus and the Spirit of Christ to those places, even when you don't say a word. You have listening ears. The presence, your presence with others is so, so absolutely important just to be there and not to rush it. Not to rush. You'll know when it's time for more. And it's always going to take longer than you think. So presence. The second gift for heartbreak, I just want to mention, is conversation. And uh, we know it is prayer, but I want to call it conversation. Uh, because it is a conversation. God starts the conversation in His Word. And there's a great verse in Psalm 5. It says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. Once again, you know, prayer isn't knowing the answers. And sometimes you pray and you go, Lord, you know, I want you to do this and this and this, and if this person or this is the solution, you give God all the answers with your prayers. You never give, make room for Him. But I'll tell you, when, when a person is deep in the valley of heartbreak, grief, and loss, when there's a conundrum, a life issue that absolutely floors them, and they don't know what to do, God gives us a gift, and it is a gift to simply cry out to Him. To cry out. That's exactly uh, what happened with Jeremiah. We cannot bear the burden ourselves. And it's as if the Spirit wells up in us to cast these cares out, to get rid of those, to vent. I have two daughters. And uh, they vent. They vent. Sometimes my wife will get a text message, you know, this long. And the question always is, as parents, okay, what do we say? What are they asking for? Now, we practiced over the years. They're not looking for mom and dad say, do this. Right. right? What they want is just, we love you. We hear you. Yeah, listen. We're just listening. That's what it is. So people need to vent. And this is what this expresses. We put it all toward God, but then we wait. We wait in expectation. There's a gift of conversation. Once again, God teaches us we can mimic. This is a picture of someone who is caring too much, right? In Africa, I would see people like this driving uh, little mobilettes or bicycles, and they'd hang about like, eight live goats from the uh, handlebars. They had chickens piled up and all their stuff. You wonder how in the world they could keep it together and keep their balance. But this is our default, isn't it? Our de default is to carry it all. Our default is to shoulder it, to have to figure it out, to have to give the solution, to be the hero sometimes, to want to make everything right. And it's also to take our own burdens and worries and heartbreak and take it all on our shoulders and think there is no help. But we hear this great psalm, and Peter later says it in the New Testament, cast your cares on the Lord and He'll sustain you. This word for cast means to throw it on and violently throw it at God. Violently throw it at Him. 
You don't have to be nice about your conversation with God. He can take it all. He can take your anger, your frustration, your dismay, your heartbreak, your questions. How many times have you had a big question for God? Why? Yeah. Why? How long? They're in the scriptures too. I ask him specific questions about issues like life issues or these gender issues, and I say, Lord, what's the answer? How do we approach a culture? But then we need to do what the psalm said, wait in expectation. Give him room to answer and guide us and teach us. In Jeremiah chapter 15, uh, we can take a look. I'm just going to look at verses uh, 15 to 18. Listen to the prophet pray. This is the great thing about the Bible. It shows real people. He said, You understand, O Lord, remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. You heard that in chapter 1. They were my joy, my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me, and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending? And my wound grievous and incurable. Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails? Listen to how he talks to God. What are you doing to me? What are you doing? To me? This is what Eugene Peterson said about it. And this is so great. God is not an idea to be studied. And we don't find Jeremiah at his desk with pen and paper, using his sharp mind and comprehensive intelligence to work out answers to the question of God. How can God, a, a good God permit an evil time? God is not a problem to be solved. What we find in Jeremiah is Jeremiah praying, addressing God, listening to God. And Jeremiah wasn't timid in his prayers. Our anger can be a measure of our faith. Listen to this. Believers argue with God. Skeptics argue with each other. Your primary debate in life issues needs to be with God. Your primary work with those human beings who are engaged in those issues is to bear the heart of God. It's to bear witness to His love, Him being a refuge and strength. And so here we have, that's Jeremiah at prayer. Scared, lonely, hurt, angry. A surprise? The indomitable Jeremiah praying like that? All of us experience these things. No one alive is a stranger to them, but do we pray them? <coughs> Jeremiah prayed them. Everything he experienced and thought, he set in relationship to a living, knowing, saving God. And the moment these things are set in relationship to God, something begins to happen. Take note of that. The moment these things are set in a relationship to God, something begins to happen. We're dealing with God's work in grace here. As you are present with someone who is broken, worried, thrown for a loop. As you converse with them, it becomes a prayer. As they cry out, and you cry out with them, it is a prayer. And something begins to happen. You might not be able to see it or quantify it, but it's true because God promises it. So prayer, conversation. I want to let you know, and this has been probably your lifeline too, my experience going through difficult times, crying out to God, just being able to cry out to Him, even if I didn't like Him. But He did something in that prayer. It was a lifeline for me, that conversation, knowing God is present and accessible, and I can pray to Him. Even though I didn't go through the thought process, oh God, you're so good to listen to me in prayer. No, just, why? Shouting to the heavens. Groaning, yeah. It's a lifeline. What prayer teaches you then? God gives you this gift. Prayer teaches you the art of conversation with those who are broken. The art of conversation with those who are broken means you listen. You receive. You reflect. As I said, you don't go to your story, tell everyone about your woes, your experiences, or how you understand this. But you validate. You ask questions. You dig deeper. You understand that conversation, true conversation, not lectures, not opinions, but true conversation is a lifeline for those who are broken and for those who are struggling with serious issues. To go deeper and ask, ask about their, the depth of their thoughts, their emotions, their struggles, their questions. 
And God blesses that conversation. So, what gets in the way of conversation? Prayer. What gets in the way? We get in the way. How do we get in the way? All right, yeah. Inclinations. What gets in the way of prayer for you in your life? Time, life. It gets crowded out, doesn't it? And this is so true. You know, go to a restaurant and try to find one without TV screens. Conversation is taken out of the picture. Go to a restaurant and try not to have everyone take out their cell phones and start looking at their own stuff. Look at a young couple or an older couple sitting at a table together and see, are they texting each other or someone else? <coughs> Why is the devil working so hard to eliminate conversation from our lives, to isolate us? Because God works in conversation with him and in true conversation and listening in a relationship with one another. It's in the way. What are some, what's prayer and encouragement and helps can you share? What helps you pray? Stay firm in your prayer and conversation with God. We share with each other, it helps us all. So what are some things you do to help pray? Yeah. Be real because he already understands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Be real because he already understands. It's true, isn't it? Sometimes we think, well, maybe like Adam and Eve, I can hide here yeah. and he won't see the real me, but he does. He gets it. You can be totally authentic. Daily devotion. Pardon me? Daily devotion. Daily devotion. Yeah. That discipline, right? I mean, there, there are books out now, secular books, that say if you have habits in your life, it takes away the stress and the decision-making process, and it actually enhances your life. A habit of laying your request before the Lord, waiting in expectation, listening to His Word. Such a great blessing. Yeah. Having someone do it with you because there's an, an accountability there. Yeah, yeah community. Someone with you, walking with you in that. And how encouraging it is, too, to find someone you can share Prayer is the most intimate thing in your life, you know, because you're bringing everything to God. And by doing that with someone else, you bring it to, some, to another person. I'll tell you, it was, uh, it was um, probably four years into my wife and I's marriage where we actually started praying out loud together. It's an intimate thing. It was during a time of real difficulty and trouble. But uh, to do that is such a great blessing, to have a prayer for you. Any other prayers? Pray the Psalms. How beautiful. I'll talk about reaching the heart, right? The Psalms. So beautiful. I'm, it's, I'm always drawn to the Psalms. It's so true. So prayer. Uh, let me just, you know, First Thessalonians 5, pray continually. Think, what does that mean? And sometimes we think that means the formal prayer in a church where the pastor's up there using all those words that you would never be able to figure out, you know, and I can't pray, you know, if I can't pray like that. No, no, no. Remember, prayer is conversation. Conversation with the one who loves you and the one you love. And you can pray continually because you always have a voice in your head, don't you? And the voice in the head is going to be saying something to you all the time. A lot of times a voice in your head is going to be saying you're not good enough or you're never going to make it through this or, you know, you're not disciplined, and you, you know, on and on and on. But what Paul gives you is this great gift. He tells you the gift of God, conversation, that that can be the voice in your head. The word of Christ that dwells in you richly and your conversation with Him. Always taking it to Him and saying, okay, Lord, man, I'm not going to have a lot of time between this and the break. I hope I can make it to the bathroom. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Lord, you brought me here safely. Bring me safely home. Watch over my loved ones. Oh, Lord, I have this friend or this brokenness in my own heart. Chart the course today. I don't know how to do it. Let me prepare and do well. Give me peace today. Just converse. The ongoing voice in your head is your continual prayer and conversation with God. And then it just comes out. It starts coming out naturally to others as well. So conversation is a great gift. And uh, here's a, a little quote. Uh, you might feel uncomfortable confronting God with issues that plague your heart and seem to put his position as the Lord of the universe in jeopardy. It may feel like taboo territory as you take the toughest topics of heartbreak to the Savior who claims to care. You may believe that asking God questions will hurt your relationship with him or cause him to cast you aside. But as you struggle to make sense of your senseless heartbreak, God invites you to bring it all to him. In Psalm 50, he says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. In Psalm 55, we are told, as you saw, Cast your burden on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. 
God gives you full permission to pour out your heart to Him and to pose every question you can muster. God wants you to wrestle with Him and invite those who are grieving and broken to wrestle with Him. And like Jacob in Genesis, don't let go until you receive the blessing. Have it out with Him. But keep contending with Him. He can handle He wants you to cry out. He can handle when you hide nothing from Him and He hears you. God gives you reassurance about His love and care even when it seems as if He has abandoned you and let the floodgates of unfair loss overwhelm you. The challenge is not necessarily in your questions or in your unleashed emotion toward Him. The big issue is not in your inquiry. It is whether or not you will listen to Him and trust His response. You see, questions posed to God are wasted if you're not attuned to His answers. The last three gifts then, so... so Presence and conversation, most important. We just have a couple minutes, but I just want to highlight these. We're not going to dig deeply into them. I want to give a couple comments. These three remain, so the three gifts, they go together. It's a bundle gift, faith, hope, and love. So as I said, we live in a microwave culture. The faithfulness of people around us is at a premium. God is faithful to you even when it seems like he's not being faithful, even when it seems like he's doing enough, God promises he is faithful. In the parable of the uh, unjust judge, remember the widow bugged the judge over and over in Luke chapter 18. you got to help me, got to help me, got to help me. Finally, the judge says, I don't like you. I don't care about anybody. But because you're bugging me, I'm going to help you. And Jesus says, if that unscrupulous judge helps this person in need, won't your father in heaven? Do you know his heart? And I love the Spurgeon quote. Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, uh, God is too good to be unkind, too wise to be confused. And when I cannot trace His hand, so I don't understand His ways, I can always trust His heart. He's trustworthy. So you say, Lord, I'm going to trust You. That's faith. Faithfulness. And you bear the image of Jesus when you faithfully never give up on the people who you may who may oppose you most, who may throw God in your face. You say, I'm going to walk faithfully. You bear that gift. Hope, of course, is hope in Jesus that casts out fear. People are afraid. The people who are so vociferous about ending lives are afraid. They're afraid. They've let fear take the wheel of their lives. But you can come with hope and love cast out fear. And that's love is the most important thing. Jesus said, people will know you're my disciples if you're really smart. No. No? No. If you know all the answers. No. If you're really good at understanding policy. If you're persuasive. If you're strong. No. If you love one another. Uh, my wife right now and I are helping to walk with my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law has dementia. They moved around the corner from her. She's dementia. And this is what we resolved. And we resolved this because God first resolved this with us. We said, we're just going to love them. We're just going to love them. We're not going to figure out the plan. You know, there's all kinds of logistics we need to take care of. But the main thing, what's our mission? We're going to love them. If the daughter comes home and says, I'm pregnant, you say, we've got to figure it out. You've got to teach her morality. What do you do? You say, we're going to love them. When a loved one is in a nursing home crying out to Jesus to take her to heaven, what do you do? I'm a love you. This is the ultimate, and this is what Jesus lifts up. We can't ignore Jesus on this. Negativity will try to grab you, critical spirit will try to take command. You will be pulled into a vortex of all kinds of debates, arguments, and opposition. But Jesus says, love, because I have loved you. That is the key to heartbreak. Love them. So, just a little commercial for the book. Uh, this book, Hope When Your Heart Breaks, uh, I have some copies back there for you. CPH has a bunch in the room. But this is meant to be a lifeline and resource. So it's written in 52 little chapters. And the little chapters are not meant to be read all in order. 
Actually, I wrote this because as a pastor, I sat with so many people going through difficulty and, of course, have experienced myself. And after prayer and after talking with somebody, then they left the room. And I thought, oh, I wish I could send something with them that they can access in this deep pain because it's not going away. It's like you could hardly take a breath without it. And so the table of contents is organized into sections that it says when everything changes, when you can't do what you used to do, when your dream dies, when you're angry, when you thought your life would go differently, when you're tired of crying, when you can't get out of bed, when you're angry at God, when you thought you knew God's plan, when you dread having to face another day, and all you need to do is open it up and find what you're feeling at that moment. And it's a short little devotion, just three little pages, and then after each one, there's mostly psalms and some reflection and journaling space and a prayer starter. And so it's meant not only for personal blessing, but I'll tell you what, sometimes people say, how do I reach out to people who don't know Jesus? I don't know what to say. You know, the place to reach out to them is when they're in the valley. And in the valley, you don't need to say anything. You can say, I just want to give you a gift. Maybe this is a lifeline for you. And that's, that's what it's written for, to be able to give people a lifeline in their heartbreak, whether it's a job loss or a death or a breakup in a relationship or the death of a pet or the deep hurt when someone reaches a certain age or whatever it may be, that's what it's for. So that's why I wrote the book, and I don't know even how much they cost. So, Maybe they're free. I could be. But I'll tell you, um, if you want, I could, I'd be happy to sign them too, and you could go around to the CPH room around the corner and pay for them there, because they know how much they cost. Uh, there's another book I have here from CPH. It's called The Life You Crave. It's all about grace. And this one is just what it says. It's about living in grace. And honestly, I wrote this book so people who... Or do not have a full understanding of faith can learn the basics of who God is. It's actually written based on the six chief parts of Luther's small catechism. There's an introduction about why Jesus. The last chapter is our purpose and mission in life. The other chapters just go through the chief parts. But you wouldn't recognize it like the catechism because it tells stories. It goes through the book of Daniel and it just discusses how we are craving the grace of God, not what the world gives. And that's what really, really meets our needs. And so everything from baptism, communion, explains it in ways that people, I hope, can understand. Prayer, confession. So that's why I wrote this one as well. They're all tools to be able to give to people so they can know there is a light in darkness, there is hope in heartbreak. Jesus is up. So why don't we say a prayer? And we'll let you roll. And if you have any questions about it, you can look at the books page through them. And they're going to be here through the whole conference, I think, all the rest of the day. So let's pray. Oh, gracious Jesus, you entered our story. And you endured the story of heartbreak so you can give us hope. For each of our hearts in this room, we need you. And we pray that you bring that to us on this day. Maybe we didn't even suspect it. But you lift us up and you embrace us. And equip us to shine that light and bring that embrace to the many people we encounter in life and to these big issues that deal with your gift of life. We trust you for that. We know that we follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you. What a joy to be with you. We really appreciate it.